Good morning. Welcome and thank you for joining this webinar on IEA's Energy Efficiency Market Report 2017, which covers global market trends and prospects. This webinar is based on a publication produced by the International Energy Agency with the same name, which is available for free on our website in English. The webinar is organized by the International Energy Agency with the kind support of the Secretaria de Energia. My name, is, my name is David Morgado. I'll be moderating the webinar, and I'm joined by my colleague Joe Ritchie from the IEA's Energy Efficiency Division and the manager of IEA's Energy Efficiency Market Reports, and he'll be carrying out this presentation. So I'll go through the agenda for today. Of course, we'd really like to hear from you and would like to include your voice in the conversation, so please ask questions and share comments so that we can discuss these at the end of the webinar. Today, we'll start with an introduction uh, just to explain how the webinar works. We'll have welcome remarks from Santiago Crujeros, Director General of Energy Efficiency and Sustainable Energy at the Ministry of Energy in Mexico. And then Joe will be presenting on the Energy Efficiency Market Report, talking about trends and indicators, the benefits for energy security, energy efficiency investment, finance, and markets. And finally, with energy, uh, talking about energy efficiency po policy. Of course, as I was saying, we have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. So in terms of uh, introduction, uh, before we start the webinar, we'd like to go through the setup of the webinar and let you know how you can participate in today's session. This slide shows you an example of the attendee interface. You should be seeing something that looks like this on your computer. If you have joined today's webinar listening through your computer speaker system by default, this means if you usually can hear music on your computer, you'll be able to hear the presentation. If you'd like to call in using the telephone, just look, locate your audio pane and select Use Telephone. The dial-in information access code will then be displayed. And those are here also here on this uh, slide. You also have to, the ability to ask questions using the question pane. Simply type in your question, either in English or Spanish, and click Send. At the end of the presentation, we will have time for discussion and we'll try to go through as many uh, questions uh, as we can. Please also note that we'll be recording the webinar and we'll make a link available for those that have missed the webinar, as well as if you want to share it with colleagues or would like to go over it again. Unless you have any questions at this time, uh, uh, if not, we will proceed with introduction speech by Santiago Crujeras. Director General of Energy Efficiency and Sustainable Energy at CENER. Gracias, David. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much to the agency and especially to David Morgado, uh, who is in charge of um, the Latin American countries at the International Energy Agency for their support in organizing the webinars and many other projects that we have been working on together and also to Brian Motherway and the rest of, of the energy efficiency team at the agency for supporting Mexico and the Ministry of Energy in terms of, of uh, the different endeavors that we have been working together. Ahora voy a hablar en, en español. Muy buenos días tengan todos ustedes. En nombre de la Secretaría de Energía me da mucho gusto darles la más cordial bienvenida a este webinar sobre el reporte del mercado de la eficiencia energética 2017. Asimismo, agradezco a la Agencia Internacional de Energía por todo el apoyo que nos han dado a lo largo de esta administración y como ustedes saben, esta práctica de webinars que iniciamos aquí en México ha resultado ser una de las prácticas más innovadoras en materia de capacitación y desarrollo de habilidades en el sector energético. Este es el webinar número 18 y bueno, pues esperamos concluir el, el año con uno más seguramente en las próximas semanas. Este webinar se basa en la edición más reciente de la publicación de la Agencia Internacional de Energía del reporte del mercado de la eficiencia energética. 
Y esta sesión tiene por objeto difundir la situación del mercado mundial de la eficiencia energética. Asimismo, el reporte 2017 incluye una revisión de la evolución de la eficiencia energética en los diferentes sectores de la economía y se examina en él el progreso de las inversiones en eficiencia energética, las finanzas y los mercados del mundo. Tenemos el gusto de que esta mañana Joe Ritchie, especialista de eficiencia energética y encargado de la publicación de los reportes del mercado de eficiencia energética, sea quien imparta este webinar desde París. Eh, quiero compartirles antes de iniciar que a la fecha hemos realizado 17 webinars con un acumulado ya de más de 2,700 personas. En este momento se encuentran eh, conectadas 215 eh, personas. Y bueno, prácticamente, además, en cuestión de género, me gusta compartirles que el 33% aproximadamente, es decir, casi la tercera parte, eh, han sido mujeres quienes se conectan a estos webinars, lo cual nos da, nos da mucho gusto, ya que el sector energético, por alguna razón que no conocemos, eh, generalmente se identifica mucho más con con eh, personas de, de sexo masculino, así que cada vez se incrementa más el número de, de mujeres en este sector y es algo que hemos estado impulsando en la Secretaría de Energía mucho durante esta administración. Sin más, eh, agradezco otra vez a, a la agencia por este apoyo. En las próximas semanas México se estará adhiriendo formalmente a la Agencia Internacional de Energía, lo cual también nos da, nos da mucho gusto y esto además seguramente fortalecerá las relaciones entre, entre la Secretaría de Energía y la, la agencia todavía mucho más. Eh, Joe Ritchie, thank you so much for, for the opportunity. Uh, we really appreciate your time and giving us the opportunity to to hear from you about this report and david thank you also for for uh, organizing this with anna lepura and the rest of of the of the team and let's get started muchísimas gracias y que disfruten de este webinar thank you santiago for your kind words and all your support uh, also with the iea's work in 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 mexico and uh, Also, through these webinars, we're very proud of holding already 17 web webinars, as you mentioned, and we're hoping that today we, we can almost reach the 3,000 uh, number in total of these 18 webinars that we've uh, held to date. Without further ado, I'm going to pass on to my colleague, Joe Ritchie, who's ready to present. Thank you. Thank you, David, and uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for your interest in the work of the IEA and also our energy efficiency 2017 report, as David said. Uh, my name is Joe Ritchie, and I was one of the project managers for the report this year. What we're going to be doing today is just going through some of the highlights from this year's report. Uh, we do have quite a few slides to go through, and that is just a small sample of what is actually contained in the report. So if you find it interesting, I would definitely encourage you to go to the IEA's website and download the report uh, and have a look at some of the information in more detail. But to start with, I'm going to talk about some of the high-level trends and indicators that we cover in Chapter 1 of our Energy Efficiency 2017 report. And the first indicator that we look at is changes in global energy intensity. This is our high-level global indicator about how much more efficient the world has become. So we can see here from this graph that before 2010, globally, energy intensity improved at an average rate of around 1.3%. But since 2010, we've actually seen an increase in the rate of energy intensity improvement. Since 2010, the average annual change in global energy intensity has been around 2.1%. This is a significant step up from the preceding decades And it should be noted that in 2016, we actually saw a slight drop in the rate of energy intensity improvement from the very substantial improvement we saw in 2015, but still in line with the observation of an increase in the rate of improvement of global energy intensity. So the question therefore 
is what do these improvements in energy intensity actually mean? Well, one of the ways in which we have done this this year is to develop a representative energy productivity bonus. Now, what this energy productivity bonus is intended to represent is the additional GDP that has been generated from global energy use as a result of improvements in energy intensity. And when we look at this, we can see, first of all, for some major economies and regions, that the improvement in energy intensity meant that there has been a substantial amount more GDP generated from energy use in 2016. For example, in China, over $1.1 trillion more GDP was generated from energy use in 2016 as a result of improvements in energy intensity, with $500 billion more GDP generated in the United States. And as we look at this on a global level, we can see that globally, the energy intensity improvement in 2016 represented an additional $2.2 trillion worth of GDP that was generated from global energy use. And this is equivalent to twice the size of the Australian economy, so very substantial. Another benefit that we highlight in this year's report relates to global energy-related CO2 emissions. Now, historically, CO2 emissions have been rising constantly each year. But what the IEA has observed is that in the last three years, we have actually seen a flattening of global CO2 emissions, even though the global economy continued to grow. So a question that we examine in our report this year is what has been the factors that have produced this flattening in global greenhouse gas emissions? Well, we examine this here. First of all, there are, first of all, there are a few factors that create an increase or drive an increase in emissions. And in particular, that is global GDP growth, which averaged around 3% between 2014 and 2016. But there are two factors that offset the global growth in GDP and resulted in a flattening of greenhouse gas emissions. The first of those is a change in the fuel mix, in particular, an increase in the amount of renewable energy and the movement away from coal-fired power generation towards lower emissions fuels, particularly gas. But the bigger factor was improvements in energy intensity. Energy intensity improvements actually were responsible for offsetting more than three quarters of the impact of GDP growth on global energy-related carbon dioxide emissions and resulted in a flattening of emissions between 2014 and 2016. In fact, if it was not for the combination of renewables and fuel mix changes and improvements in energy intensity, emissions in 2016 would have actually been 2 billion tonnes higher. So it's actually a substantial impact. We also in the report look at the impact of energy efficiency on global energy use, and we do this for two major country groupings. The first of those, as you see here on the left, is IEA member countries, and the other is major emerging economies. Now, these major emerging economies include China, India, Mexico, Brazil, Indonesia, and Russia. And the impacts of energy efficiency have been different in both countries. So first of all, this is what the energy use in these two region, regional groupings would have been in 2016 without improvements in energy intensity since 2000. However, when we look at the impacts of energy efficiency, we actually see that in IEA member, IEA member countries, energy efficiency improvements since 2000 have actually resulted in energy use being reduced to levels that have not been seen since the 1990s. And in the major emerging economies, improvements in energy efficiency have actually avoided 13% more energy use. And globally, since 2000, energy efficiency improvements have resulted in 12% less energy being used in 2016 than would have otherwise been the case. And that is equivalent to the energy use of the entire European Union. So energy efficiency is having a substantial impact on the global energy system. Another area where we look at the impact of energy efficiency improvements is actually on global emissions. Now, first of all, on the left-hand side here, we see this dark blue line, which is the world's actual greenhouse gas emissions between 2000 and 2016. And we can see here the flattening of emissions in recent years. But what would emissions have been without improvements in energy intensity? Well, 
they would have actually been 12.5% higher in 2016 without the improvements in energy intensity. And as you can see here, there would not have been the flattening that, there we, that we observed between 2014 and 2016. And in terms of where the actual emissions abatement has come from, we look at that again on the basis of regional grouping. And we can see here that historically, IEA member countries have been responsible for the largest percentage of greenhouse gas emissions reductions resulting from energy efficiency. But in 2016, it was actually the major emerging economies that were responsible for 47% of the global emissions reductions from improvements in energy efficiency, with IEA uh, countries responsible for 45%. So major emerging economies are now starting to have a big impact on emissions reductions as a result of improvements in energy efficiency. Now, what we've done for this presentation today is that we've, undertake, we've undertaken a decomposition of energy use in Mexico. Now, in our report, Energy Efficiency 2017, we undertake a whole series of decomposition analyses where we decompose energy use into the various factors that impact how it grows or shrinks. And what we've done here is decompose Mexican energy use between 2000 and 2015 in order to understand what the impact of energy efficiency has been on energy use in Mexico. So the first effect that we highlight is the growth effect. And this growth effect is essentially increases in Mexican GDP, which increases the demand for energy services. And that has had an uplifting effect on energy use within Mexico. We've also seen changes in what we refer to as residential and transport structure, which basically means more floor area and more people driving vehicles. And that again has had an increasing impact on energy use. But there have been two factors which have offset part of these effects. The first of those is changes in economic structure, particularly the movement away from energy intensive industries towards less energy intensive services sectors within the Mexican economy. And the second of those is improvement in energy efficiency. Now these have had a smaller impact, but they have had an impact. Uh, but overall, Mexican energy use is about two thirds higher in 2015 than it was in 2000. But just coming back to the energy efficiency improvements, and what we have actually found is that efficiency improvements are most apparent in the residential and passenger vehicle sector. And that is, most, uh, and that is primarily due to minimum energy performance standards for household appliances and also vehicle fuel economy standards that have been in place in Mexico. We also quantify in our energy efficiency 2017 report the benefits from energy efficiency to individual households in major economies. And here we highlight some major economies and the amount of energy expenditure that has been saved by households in these economies as a result of energy efficiency improvements since 2000. And now these energy savings are in relation to the amount of uh, household gas and electricity consumption, and also the reductions in the amount of gasoline that is used to fuel individual passenger vehicles. So we can see, for example, that in Germany, improvements in energy efficiency since 2000 have actually avoided 580 US dollars more energy expenditure per capita for the German residential sector than would otherwise have been the case. And we can see similar results in other countries. And for example, in Japan, without improvements in energy efficiency since 2000, the Japanese residential consumers would have been paying 35% more for their household energy and travel costs in 2016 than would have otherwise been the case. And we also do this for Mexico. And what we've found that if it was not for energy efficiency improvements since 2000 in the residential sector, Mexican consumers will be paying 10% more for their energy use in 2016. And that, and, that, and that is equivalent to about US $60 more per capita per year as a result of energy efficiency. So those savings are obviously substantial and they flow right down from the whole of the economy to the individual household. So now, as David said, the other thing I want to cover off and talk about today is the benefits to energy security that result from improvements in energy efficiency. And the most apparent benefit from improvements to energy efficiency for energy security 
is that improvements in efficiency avoid the need for additional imports of gas, oil and coal in order for countries to satisfy their domestic energy demand. And we highlight this for a couple of major importing countries. And on the left hand side here, we first of all look at the impact of energy efficiency improvements on gas imports. So we can see here that in 2016, as a result of efficiency improvements since 2000, that Japan, Germany and the United Kingdom all avoided a substantial amount more gas imports as a result of improvements in efficiency. When we look at this as a percentage of the total imports, we actually see an interesting story, and that is that in the UK, the reduction in gas imports that result from energy efficiency are actually equivalent to around 80% of their current gas imports. And that is because in the UK, they actually have a part of their uh, gas demand that is satisfied by local resources. And now when we look at oil, another major imported energy product, we see that Japan is very significant. In Japan, they have avoided 20% more oil imports as a result of efficiency improvements since 2000, with the primary efficiency measure being improvements in vehicle fuel efficiency. And across all IA member countries, we actually find that if it was not for energy efficiency improvements since 2000, that IA member countries would have actually spent $50 billion more on energy imports in 2016 than they otherwise would have. That is a substantial benefit to trade balances and a substantial benefit to energy security. And the other aspect of energy security, which we highlight in our report, is the impact on, on, on short-term energy security, particularly short-term gas security in Europe. Now in Europe, members, member states of the European Union are required to satisfy what is called the N-1 supply requirement. And what this requirement means is that European member countries must be able to ensure that they have a sufficient access to gas such that if a major pipeline or a major storage facility went offline, that they would still have enough access to meet their historic daily peak gas demand. Now this is what they refer to as the N-1 supply requirement. And we can see here some, peak, uh, some historic peak daily gas demands in major European gas markets, in particular Germany, the United Kingdom and France. Now when we look at the amount of supply that they have to meet their N-1 requirement, we see that all three countries currently satisfy. Germany does to a very large extent and the UK and France satisfies them, but with lesser of a margin. Now the question could be, what has been the impact of energy efficiency on this N-1 supply requirement? Well, what we actually found that if it was not for improvements in energy efficiency, particularly the energy efficiency of space heating and also the energy efficiency of industry, that peak daily gas demand in the United Kingdom and in France would have actually been higher. And as a result, the UK and France would not meet their N-1 supply requirements. In fact, the UK and France would need an additional 240 million cubic metres of gas per day to maintain their current N-1 supply requirement. And this additional amount of gas is actually equivalent to more than five times the United Kingdom's current largest gas storage site. So energy efficiency has also had a substantial impact on, uh, on, on short-term energy security and on peak gas demand in Europe. So now moving on to some major uh, energy using sectors which we cover off in our report. Uh, and we look at industry, buildings and transport. And starting here with industry, we can see here, first of all, the energy use in I, uh, of, of industry in IA member countries and major emerging economies. And we can see that in IA member countries, energy use within industry has decreased, whereas in the major emerging economies that we analysed, industrial energy use has actually grown substantially. When we compare this to the gross value added that has been generated by the industry sector in these countries, we see that in IEA member countries that energy use and gross value added have essentially decoupled, whereas in the major emerging economies, they are growing at much different rates. Now what this means is that we have seen energy intensity improve both by around 30% in both IEA member, IEA member countries and major emerging economies. And likewise, we have also seen energy productivity, 
which is a GVA per unit of energy use, increase by again 40% in both IEA member countries and major emerging economies. Now just focusing here on the major emerging economies, I want to highlight a couple of key trends here. We can see that before 2006, that energy use and gross value added in major emerging economies grew at a very similar rate. But in 2006, China, which is the most substantial of the major emerging economies that we analysed, introduced its 11th five-year plan, which put in place its top 1,000 industry energy efficiency program, which set energy intensity targets for energy users in China. And that resulted in energy use starting to move away from the gross value added line. And in 2011, China also introduced its 12th five-year plan. Now in this 12th five-year plan, China uh, expanded its industry program from top 1,000 to top 10,000. And that has since resulted in a much, uh, much slower rate of energy demand growth and a much larger gap between the trends for gross value added and for energy use. So this policy in China has had a major impact on energy use within major emerging economies. But there are some sectors for which policy uh, is not as big of an impact, and in some cases, the impact is more related to the construction of new production capacity. And one such energy intensive sector that we highlight in our report is the primary aluminium smelting sector. And we can see here that in the established areas of Europe and North America, that because they have a lot of already pre-established production capacity within primary aluminium production, that their energy intensity has been reasonably constant since 2000. However, when we look at the regions where there have been new aluminium production capacity built in recent years, we see a much different trend. In what, we re in what is referred to as the Gulf Cooperation Council uh, of uh, Corporation of Countries, which is essentially Middle East countries, we see that energy use has been, energy intensity I should say, has been much lower. And also when we look at China, where there has been very strong demand and also a lot of availability to low cost coal, which can be used to generate electricity, we've seen energy intensity improve at a much faster rate than it has in other parts of the world. And what this has actually meant is that globally, the energy intensity of primary aluminium production has actually fallen by 7% between 2000 and 2015. And this has been primarily as a result of the development and the installation of new production capacity in areas like China and also the Gulf Cooperation Council countries. Another sector that we highlight in the report is the cement manufacturing sector. And here we see the thermal energy intensity of cement manufacturing in 2014. And we can see here that India actually has the lowest thermal energy intensity of the countries that we've analysed. In fact, when we look at what the IEA deems to be current best available technology for cement manufacturing, we see that India is the country that is closest to best available technology. And this is primarily because in India, there has been a lot of new production capacity recently added, and they also have access to very low moisture content raw materials. But again, we see the impact of new production capacity on energy efficiency in the industry sector. But what about other industry sectors where there hasn't been as much new production capacity? Well, one of the things that we are seeing as being a major driver of improvements in energy efficiency has been uptake of energy management systems. Now, for those who don't know, an energy management system essentially provides the framework and structure for an industrial firm or a commercial firm to understand how energy is being used, to identify opportunities to improve energy efficiency, and then implement and monitor those projects over time. And the global standard for energy management is ISO 50001. And ISO 50001 has been in place since 2011. And by the end of 2015, 85% of global ISO 50001 certifications were in Europe, a very substantial figure. When we look at that on the basis of countries, we can actually see that Germany is head and shoulders above all other countries in terms of the number of ISO 50001 certificates. In fact, Germany has nearly half of the global ISO 50001 certificates as of the end of 2015. And that is because, and one of the contributing factors for that is because in Germany, they have very strong tax incentives for companies to implement energy management. 
An interesting, an interesting trend which we, which we highlight is that when we look at the number of ISO 50001 certified sites, we actually see that it is France that has the highest number of certified sites. Now this is because in France, there are some major supermarket chains that have obtained ISO 50001 certification and the large number of sites within that certification means that they have a very high number of certified sites. Now, one country that you don't see mentioned here is China. And that is because China is not implementing energy management. It is more because they favor a different energy management system, in particular, the GBT23331 system, which they use as the basis for their industrial energy management and energy efficiency programs. So moving on now to the building sector, and in this year's report, we looked at the change in the build in building sector energy consumption since 2010. And we, can, and we can see here that the major end uses within the building sector are space heating, water heating, and cooking. But what we also see here is that between 2010 and 2016, there's actually been a slight increase in building energy use. And the reason for this is, is because when we look first of all, at the growth in floor area in the building sector, we actually see that per annum, 2% more floor area is added globally within the building sector. And when we look at the energy intensity improvement per year, we actually find that this lags behind the growth in the floor area. So as a result, energy use in the building sector is continuing to grow as we are seeing more floor area being constructed and that floor area is being constructed at a rate that is faster than the rate at which energy intensity is improving. Also this year, we, we highlight some major growing energy demands within the building sector. And in particular, we look at space cooling. Now between 1990 and 2015, space cooling was the fastest growing source of energy demand in the building sector. And after 2050, we see this as continuing to be the case. And this demand for space cooling will come primarily from emerging economies where the climate is hotter. And that includes Mexico, Indonesia, India, and China. But when we think about those countries, what we actually see is some more concerning trends in terms of the current strength of efficiency policies. So what we show here on this graph is the strength of uh, minimum energy performance standards for air conditioners in a number of countries. And we gauge that by how close the minimum energy performance standard is to best available technology or BAT. And we can see here that Japan has the world leading uh, energy efficiency standards for air conditioners. Their, their standards, their minimum energy performance standards are actually around 65% that of best available technology. But when we look at the other end of the scale, we see some more concerning trends. Mexico, India, and Indonesia have some of the weakest air conditioning standards currently. In fact, they're about 60% weaker than in Japan. But this is where energy, energy demand for space cooling is growing fastest. So we actually want to see the strength of these standards increased in order for energy efficiency of space cooling to improve and for us to avoid an unnecessary amount of energy use to ensure that demand for space cooling can actually be satisfied. Moving on now to the transport sector, and one trend that we have highlighted in this year's report is the market shift towards larger passenger vehicles, in particular, the, in particular vehicles such as vans, uh, SUVs, otherwise known as sport utility vehicles, and pickups. And here we see the increasing demand for these cars in North America. Now, the reason why we've actually seen an increase in demand for these larger vehicles is because oil prices have, been, have actually been lower. And lower oil prices have translated to lower gasoline prices at the pump, which means that people are more inclined to buy larger vehicles with lower fuel economy. In fact, between 2014 and 2016, the sales of these larger passenger vehicles increased by 17% in Canada, 15% in the United States, and 2% in Mexico. And this increasing uptake of these larger passenger vehicles is actually dampening the global rate of vehicle fuel efficiency improvement. Another area of the transport sector that we focus on this year is what we're referring to the two-speed vehicle efficiency policy. And that is the difference between current policy coverage for cars and trucks. So we can see from the graph on the left 
that about 56% of energy use associated with cars is covered by some form of mandatory fuel efficiency standard. In fact, nearly 40 countries have fuel efficiency standards for cars. However, the story is much different when we look at trucks. Currently, only 16% of the energy use for trucks globally is covered by a mandatory efficiency policy, and only four countries, China, the United States, Japan, and Canada, have fuel efficiency standards for trucks. Now, what this actually means is that trucks, which, actually, which are growing quite fast in terms of their energy demand, and represent about 43% of global oil uh, energy demand for road transport, do not, uh, are actually much less covered by efficiency policy and are much less subject to improvements. Uh, no, And the first of all, in this year's report, we again look at the magnitude of energy efficiency investment globally. In 2015, there, there was about $213 billion worth of energy efficiency investment globally. And in 2016, this grew by about 9% to reach $231 billion. Growth was strongest in China, but the largest source of energy efficiency investment actually comes from Europe. And when we look at energy efficiency investment on the basis of end use sector, we see that it is the building sector that is very dominant. Over half of global energy efficiency investment comes from the building sector. Now, looking in more detail at buildings, we can actually see that the majority of, of in 2015, first of all, that the majority of investments in the building sector went to what we refer to as the building envelope. And that includes things like building fabric, windows, and also insulation, which reduces the need for space cooling and reduces also the need for space heating. Now, in 2016, we've seen investment increase in all areas of the building uh, sector. The envelope has increased quite a bit, but the most noticeable increase has actually been in lighting, where we're, we're again seeing increasing uptake of very efficient lighting products, particularly LEDs. And in 2016, 75% of spending on building retrofits was actually considered to be energy efficiency investment. So the building sector is very important and is a key driver of global energy efficiency investment. In this year's report, we also highlight the growing role for green banks in driving energy efficiency and clean energy investment. For those who don't know, a green bank is essentially a publicly funded bank, which has an explicit mandate to fund clean energy projects which include renewable energy, energy efficiency, and other projects such as batteries and electric vehicles. By the end of 2016, green banks globally had invested nearly US $8 billion in clean energy projects. And that has actually resulted in about 2.25 times as much private sector investment. Of this, energy efficiency represented about 19% of global investment, much less than renewable energy, but still a growing source of investment that we highlight in our report. The other area of, of growth that we highlight in, 20, in 2016 is the Global Energy Service Company or ESCO market. We see here that in 2016, the global ESCO market grew to be over $26 billion uh, in, in total value and a total revenue. China was by far the largest source of global ESCO revenue with more than $15 billion worth of revenue in China alone. It's necessary to note that in China, there are some very strong incentives for companies to implement an energy efficiency project through an ESCO, which has very much driven growth in the market. The other substantial market is the United States and also Europe, uh, and we also see some growth in India as well. But China is very much the global driver of the ESCO market. So now moving on to energy efficiency policy. And this is where we have a, a lot of focus in particular on mandatory energy efficiency policy, which includes things like minimum energy performance standards for electrical appliances, and also vehicle fuel efficiency standards. And it is here within policy that we actually saw some more concerning trends in 2016. First of all, what we look at within the report is policy coverage 
Now, when we, what we mean by policy coverage is when a government implements a minimum energy performance standard, uh, any new appliances that are purchased that are subject to that standard, uh, the energy use of those appliances, once they are installed, would be deemed to be covered. So if I had, say, for example, a refrigerator, which I bought in the 1990s, that was not covered by an efficiency standard, uh, that energy use would not be covered. However, if I purchased a new refrigerator that was covered by a mandatory efficiency policy, then the energy use of that refrigerator, of that refrigerator would be deemed to be covered. And what we look at in our Energy Efficiency 2017 report is the percentage of uh, final energy use within key energy using sectors that is currently subject to mandatory, fuel, to mandatory energy efficiency policies. Now looking here across the sectors for the entire world, we see that coverage is highest within the residential, non-residential and industry sectors. And that globally, around 32% of global en final energy use is covered by mandatory efficiency policies. That leaves still 68% of global energy use that is not covered by mandatory policies. Now, looking in particular at Mexico, we can see that in Mexico, you actually have uh, policy coverage much higher than the global average for the residential and non-residential sector, which reflects the longevity of standards in Mexico. But coverage is a lot lower in the industry sector and also in the transport sector. And overall, 18% of energy use in Mexico is covered by mandatory efficiency policies. However, if all energy using equipment in Mexico was replaced, then total policy coverage would actually be over 50%. So actually in Mexico, there are a lot of policies in place, but there's still a lot of appliances being used that have been that were purchased or installed prior to the implementation of efficiency policies. And so we would expect to see this coverage grow in future as more of these appliances are replaced. Now, not all mandatory efficiency policies are the same. One thing that we also look at in this year's report is the changes in the strength of mandatory efficiency policies. So what we mean by strength is how stringent an efficiency policy is, such as a mandatory uh, a minimum energy performance standard, how stringent that policy is uh, in order for a technology or for an appliance to be sold onto the market. And what we do is we compare the increase in policy strength compared to 2000. And we can see here that in 2012, 2013, we saw some considerable increases in policy strength and similarly in 2015. But in a worrying trend, we've actually seen strength increase in 2016 be, some of the, be one of the lowest for recent years. And increases in policy strength in 2016 were primarily a result of fuel economy standards and space heating performance standards. But we were seeing a potentially worrying slowdown in the increasing strength of mandatory efficiency policies. So what we do here, what we do at the IEA is that we combine the policy coverage and policy strength into what we refer to as our Efficiency Policy Progress Index, or EPI. And as I said, what the EPI does is that it tracks the increasing policy coverage and policy strength since 2000. And we see here on this graph the EPI score for a number of large economies between 2000 and 2010. However, when we look at the increasing between 20, 2011 and 2015, the EPI score increases quite markedly. Most notably in countries like China, the United Kingdom, Japan and Germany, the EPI is all higher, is higher than the global average, which is around 6.3. In Mexico, the EPI is somewhat lower. However, we've actually seen growth been most uh, apparent since 2011 and into 2016. So again, with the policies that are in place and as new energy using equipment is brought into use, we would expect to see this efficiency policy progress index rise. And further increases will be possible if the strength of mandatory efficiency policies in Mexico was increased. And what we also look at is the contribution, uh, sorry, what we also look at in uh, the Energy Efficiency 2017 report is the year-on-year -year growth of our Efficiency Policy Progress Index. And this yearly growth gives an indication 
about well, how much policy has progressed in an individual year. Now, for example, we can see here from this graph that in 2011, there was quite a large amount of policy progress. And that is because, as I highlighted earlier in the presentation, that China implemented its 12th five-year plan. Between 2012 and 2015, we saw a similar rate of improvement in policy progress. However, in 2016, this actually decreased. Now, this is a worrying trend. And to find out why this has happened, we need to look at the two factors that influence increases in policy progress. And there are two factors that influence this. The first of those is the introduction of, the first of those, I should say, is pre-existing policies. Now, pre-existing policies is essentially the replacement of old appliances with new appliances that are covered by policies which were already in existence. And we can see here that historically, existing policies have driven uh, policy progress each year. In fact, as we see, more, as we see uh, more uptake of efficient appliances, the impact of existing policies grow. But the other thing that influences policy progress is the implementation of new policies or the strengthening of existing policies. Now, these new policies effectively create a new energy, uh, a new uh, coverage of energy use that was not previously covered, or they strengthen the existing standard. And in 2016, what we actually found was that global policy progress was driven more by existing policies than new policies. In fact, in 2016, we saw a noticeable slowdown in the implementation of new energy efficiency policies. Now, this is a worrying trend. All of the benefits that I highlighted at the start of today's presentation have been the result of concerted policy action by governments. If we do not see a greater implementation and a greater focus on the implementation of new energy efficiency policies, then the benefits that we are seeing might start to erode. Now, this is obviously important and it's the key finding that we highlight in this year's report and a worrying trend as well that we need to see more policy action from government in order to continue to enjoy the benefits that we have seen from improvements in energy efficiency. The last, in the last couple of slides for today's presentation, I want to just highlight two, one particular form of policy instrument that we have a focus on in this year's report, and that is the use of energy utility obligations. Now, energy utility obligations have been used in a number of countries and this is where a government obligates an energy utility, in particular electricity or gas retailers, to achieve a certain amount of energy savings each year. They have been very effective in some countries and have been very popular, particularly in the European Union, in China and the United States. In fact, between 2005 to 2016, the amount of global final energy use that is actually covered by utility obligation programs rose from 7% to around 19%. And when we look at the actual savings that have, been achieved, that have been achieved as a result of these utility obligation schemes, well, we actually see that in some countries like France, Italy, and Denmark, they have actually achieved energy savings that can be as, and that can be as in many cases, around 5% of the country's total final energy consumption. That obviously tails down in other countries and globally, we are seeing about 0.5% of global energy use being saved as a result of these energy utility obligations. And in particular, in France and Italy, where the two highest savings have been achieved, they actually have trading. So the energy savings can be traded uh, between the producers of those uh, savings, uh, like energy service companies, and the, and the utilities can buy those, and they're actually traded within a market. And that creates a greater incentive and a greater market for energy efficiency. So this is the policy that we highlight in this year's report. And we also have another report within the IEA which looks at the use of market-based market -based instruments for energy efficiency uh, globally and also some of the policy mechanisms that can be used. So that's all the slides that I had today, but just a couple of concluding remarks we want to highlight. First of all, our report Energy Efficiency 2017 does show the critical importance of energy efficiency to economies, households and the environment. And we do see that there has been a step up in energy efficiency gains in recent years, despite lower energy prices, in particular lower, energy, lower uh, oil prices. 
And this has, is having many positive impacts for economies, households, and the environment, as I've highlighted. However, we do see a more concerning trend, and that is that governments need to renew their focus on policy implementation. We saw policy implementation slow in 2016, and so therefore we need to see governments maintain their focus on attacking the 68% of energy use that is not covered by mandatory efficiency policies. I also mentioned at the very start of the, uh, of the presentation the benefits that has been obtained from the combination of renewable energy and energy efficiency. The combination of these two fuels is something that we uh, will see and cover in more detail in the upcoming World Energy Outlook. And globally, we do need to see uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy brought into the global energy system through a harmonised policy approach. This is, an, this is an important area of work for the IEA and one that we're putting a lot of emphasis on. And finally, within the IEA, we are continuing to help countries realise the unmet energy efficiency potential. And we do this by training policymakers, facilitating knowledge exchange, and also providing real world policy advice. So in essence, we are here to help. And in terms of training, I'll hand back over to David, who'll talk about an upcoming training event in Latin America. Thank you very much, Joe, for a very interesting uh, presentation, and I think very, very clear. I hope everybody has enjoyed it. Uh, before we go to the Q&A, and to give uh, Joe a bit of a, a rest, and so he can read some of the questions, I'd just like to mention to everybody uh, online that we are organizing together with the Latin American Development Bank, uh, CAF, an energy efficiency training week in Latin America to be held in Rio de Janeiro from the 27th of November to the 1st of December. And if you are interested and you can self-fund yourself to attend the event, uh, please go to the website indicated below or just Google Energy Efficiency Training Week in Latin America, IEA 2017, and you'll find it. And you can see all the information there and you can register. The thing I'd like to highlight that it, you must register uh, before the 5th of November. Um, and uh, again, all the information is there regarding the training. So there'll be training for buildings, for people that are interested in industry, energy efficiency in industry, uh, in appliances and uh, transport. And so we now are uh, running a bit out of time, but we I think we'll give another 10 minutes for Q&A. So people, again, if you can uh, use the question uh, pain uh, and just type in your question either in English or Spanish and we'll start going through them and try to answer as many as possible. I think Joe's had a look at uh, a couple of them are, are already. Uh, okay, so we'll, we'll start with this one here. Um, what's the view of the IEA on energy efficiency in the United States? Uh, is it backing off from previous actions? Joe? Sure, thanks Dave. This, this is a question that we've uh, received quite a bit. Obviously a lot of people uh, watching what's going on in the United States and asking the question about what are they doing in relation to energy efficiency. Um, it is very important to note when, when we ask, when, when looking at this question is that the United States has a very long history of energy efficiency improvement. It was actually the first country in the world to implement fuel efficiency standards for cars. Uh, and it has also led the way with many other uh, policies for energy using appliances, the majority of which are still in place and the majority of which were actually implemented before 2000. One of the other things in the United States is that uh, efficiency policy is not just uh, subject to the federal government. A lot of efficiency is actually undertaken at a state or a regional level. In fact, when I highlighted earlier some of the energy utility obligation schemes that are in place, a lot of those uh, within the US are actually within US states. In fact, 25 US states have energy utility obligations that are currently in place, and those obligations continue uh, into the future. And it's also important to note is that energy efficiency obviously creates a large number of benefits that go beyond just environmental benefits. As we've highlighted here today, improvements in the economy and also improvements in energy security are just some of the benefits that go beyond just and just go just go beyond just the environmental sphere and obviously a key benefit that can be highlighted uh, for all, all nations. Thank you, Joe. We're getting a lot of uh, questions at the moment. Um, so we're trying to go through them. Uh, 
I think that we'll go to the second one here. Uh, what does the IEA see as a major policy challenge or area of action in the future? Sure. So I think within, uh, and, and, and I'll touch on this with a with specific reference to Mexico. Um, now, in terms of uh, a major policy challenge, I highlighted two in the presentation specifically. Uh, the first of those was around energy efficiency standards for trucks. Uh, we highlighted that uh, trucks are responsible for about 43% of global road transport oil consumption. Uh, that's quite a bit, but there's only four countries globally that have fuel efficiency standards for trucks. Mexico is not currently one of those countries, and so that's obviously an area of action that we would like to see in the future. And the other big action that we highlight in, uh, in, in the report, and I highlight in the presentation, is space cooling. The, the uh, policies and the strength of minimum energy performance standards for air conditioners is currently weakest in countries where demand is growing fastest. So we do need to see the strength of those standards increase in order to avoid unnecessary energy use into the future. Um, and obviously we also see a lot of benefit from energy efficiency within the industry sector. As I highlighted, uh, take up of energy management systems such as ISO 50001 has been very common within Europe, uh, and that's been incentivized by tax incentives that actually provide a financial incentive for industry to implement energy management systems. Uh, but uh, we don't see that to the same degree within other countries globally, and uh, the energy industry sector is obviously a very important driver of global energy use and a driver of global emissions. Uh, so we do obviously see uh, a lot of benefits coming from improvements in industrial energy efficiency policy into the future. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I've got here a, a question on uh, industry in Mexico and where the, the opportunities I, I, can, I can answer a bit of, of that based on uh, working with the Ministry of Energy and with Conue there. I, I think definitely what I can see is there's a, an energy intensive industry registration system that's in place, which uh, on paper is very well uh, set up. And I think there's definitely uh, opportunities to strengthen that uh, process to be very much used as a, a stick to get the energy intensive industries in Mexico moving. And I think that it would be important to revive that system and make sure that it's being completely enforced and even try to expand the scope uh, at, the, at the moment. And I think that'd be very important because it would support the Mexican industry in becoming more competitive, uh, increase in productivity, uh, possibly even support creation of, of uh, jobs as well. So there's a, no, a number of added benefits and it would be very important to, to support uh, uh, this uh, system to work uh, as, to its fullest uh, capacity. And I think that'd be important. And of course, there's also a need to uh, look at where there's opportunities to also provide some form of incentive to get a greater number of, uh, of the industries to adopt energy management systems. As Joe mentioned in his presentation, it's quite an important uh, process uh, for, for particularly for industries and again the uptake there has been quite quite low uh, there's been a number of efforts being made by by Konui to increase that number with support from a number of international development agencies but it would be important to find a way of incentive uh, providing greater incentives through tax through uh, rebates uh, through cap further capacity building or even considering voluntary agreements to really increase that uptake in of energy efficiency in industry, I don't know if Joe, you would like to add any. No, I think I think um, and I'm just looking at a question here from Luis about the use of uh, organic Rankin cycles in industry and whether that's classified as an energy efficient uh, efficiency uh, technology. Um, you know, the the uh, an organic Rankin cycle which effectively utilizes waste heat to produce electricity would definitely be considered as an energy efficiency measure. Um, in a lot of industries globally, uh, waste heat is a major uh, drain on, on, uh, on the productivity and the efficiency of the industrial plant. And so the ability for an industry to actually capture that waste heat and then use that to generate electricity would definitely be considered um, uh, an energy efficiency measure. Uh, but one of the big issues there that we see is around finance. In many cases, uh, industries might not have uh, the capital uh, uh, available to fund uh, these, these sort of energy efficiency retrofits. Uh, and we also see in many cases that industries uh, might also not be able to access uh, debt finance from private sector banks and others. 
so obviously the ability for industry to uh, obtain access to finance is a, uh, is, a, is, is a key thing and a key measure that will actually drive greater uptake in the future. Thank you, Joe. There's, a, of course, a very interesting topic at the moment in, in Mexico, looking at energy transition and, and the balance with, with renewable energy. And I think that might be something uh, worth uh, discussing and it's something that we covered uh, a lot in the, the market report, how can energy efficiency be an enabler for renewable energy? So that yeah, I mean, this is, this is something as well that oftentimes we get asked the question that in, in a future where we have a large amount of renewable energy, uh, where we don't have the same issue with uh, greenhouse gas emissions from energy consumption that we do at the moment, do we need to still have energy efficiency? And look, it's certainly not true that uh, renewable energy reduces the need for energy efficiency. We actually need to better recognise the synergies that are available between energy efficiency and renewables, uh, and in particular within the energy market and policy development. Um, one thing that we highlight uh, between the synergies is actually in relation to energy access. So renewable energy can actually greatly improve energy access for some poorer or remote communities that don't uh, have currently connection to an electricity grid. And things like off-grid solar PV systems can actually improve access to electricity. Now, in these sort of situations, the use of efficient appliances, say efficient televisions or efficient refrigerators or efficient uh, air conditioners, will actually mean that less energy use is required to actually satisfy uh, energy demand. And what this means essentially is that energy efficiency and renewables are working hand in hand, whereby energy efficiency reduces the amount of energy demand that is required to provide energy services, uh, and renewable energy obviously reduces the uh, greenhouse gas emissions and the environmental impact of that energy use. So definitely within uh, you know, providing energy access, we see a lot of synergies between renewable energy and energy efficiency. And we need to see them as not being exclusive, but we need to see them as working together in order to drive global decarbonisation. Uh, okay, so in terms of yeah, we, we have a question here about how we actually calculate the effects with and without energy efficiency. Um, this is a, a question that goes more to methodology and I, and I uh, encourage you to have a look at the report where we have um, some detailed annexes which look at decomposition analysis and which also look at how we calculate our efficiency policy progress index. But basically what we have at the IEA is that we have a bunch of indicators which look at the improvement in energy efficiency, say for example, the amount of energy use that is required to heat or cool a building uh, per square metre. And what we have is the ability to track the improvement in that indicator over time. So how much, how much has the energy, how, how much did to cool or heat a square metre of building? How much was that in 2000? How much was that in 2016? And what we can say is that if, the, if that indicator, if the energy, if the energy required to heat or cool a square metre of building space was the same in 2016 as the same as it was in 2000, and we saw the same amount of increase in building uh, floor area, what would be the additional energy use that would actually have been obtained? So what we're looking at is a counterfactual scenario where we're seeing the, an increase in demand for energy services following the same trajectory, but we're not seeing an improvement in the energy intensity of some of the energy using uh, applications. And so therefore, we're able to distinguish what would be the actual additional energy that would have been incurred had energy efficiency not improved. But as I said, there's a lot more information that's available in our report. Uh, but uh, thank you for the question and thank you for the interest. Thank you very much. I think, uh, unfortunately, we're not able to go through all the questions. Again, thank everybody for, for your attention and participation in today's webinar. Uh, the presentation should be available by the end of the week on the IEA's YouTube web website and we will be sending you a link and as well as a PDF of the presentation. Please do feel free to share it with your colleagues. For us, it's been a real pleasure to conduct this webinar, which we hope you found useful. We'd like to especially thank uh, Sener and Anna Lapour, who's our IEA staff at Sener, for all their support in helping us organize these webinars. We'll continue to organize other energy efficiency webinars. Hopefully the next one will be in December 2017, as Santiago mentioned and we're hoping to do that one on the multiple benefits of energy efficiency. 
We'll keep you informed and please do not hesitate to contact us if you have any questions. Thank you.